Now, I think we all know that appearances can be deceiving. And yet many of us, if not most of us, are often quick to judge others based on their appearance. We see this happen in a lot of different ways. Certainly racism is an obvious example. People making snap judgments or justifying their fear or hatred of another person because of the color of their skin. What about ageism? Many young people will see an older person's gray hair and automatically assume that they're out of touch and old fashioned in their attitudes and behavior. And many older people will see a young person's energy and enthusiasm and assume that they're foolish or reckless. I know from personal experience that some people automatically assume that I'm less intelligent and lazy simply because I'm overweight. Another example that I find very interesting is that even though more and more people, young and old, are getting tattoos, there's still a prejudice against people who have them. A 2018 article in Psychology Today estimated that 20 to 30 percent of Americans have at least one tattoo and 15 to 20 percent have more than one, with more younger people having them than older. Yet despite the increasing popularity of tattoos, there's still a stigma about having one. For example, people who have tattoos are often viewed by others as being less competent, less intelligent, more likely to be promiscuous and more likely to drink heavily. And men or women with tattoos are indeed judged more harshly than men. The article cited a study done by researchers to determine how different people view others who have tattoos. They gathered two groups of people, college students and general community members, with people who had tattoos and those who didn't in both groups. The participants were shown photos of men and women who had tattoos and then also the same images with the tattoos digitally removed from the photos. Remarkably, even the participants who had tattoos had lower opinions of the uh, photographed people with tattoos than those with the tattoos removed. While the researchers predicted that tattooed participants would favor people who were more like them, there was clearly a generally negative stigma about having tattoo. Now, regardless of your own personal opinion of tattoos, I would hope that we would all uh, understand that assuming anything at all, good or bad, about a person because of their physical appearance is simply wrong. For example, uh, in the Bible, when the nation of Israel wanted a king like all the other nations had, they saw Saul, uh, they saw his height, and they thought, well, he looks like a king. But God told them in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Jesus also warned that appearances can be deceiving, saying in Matthew 23, verse 27, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. Obviously, Jesus saw things differently. So when his followers made a snap judgment about a blind man who was begging near the temple, Jesus immediately tried to clear up their misunderstanding and demonstrate another sign of the new life that he came to bring. John describes this incident in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming, when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed, and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. 
How then were your eyes open? They demanded. And he replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. Again, Jesus performed a miraculous sign to demonstrate that he has the power, authority, and purpose to give new life, which John tells us was his purpose for recording this episode from Jesus' life and ministry. Uh, writing in John 20, verse 31, These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Certainly. This man who had been born blind received a whole new life when Jesus healed him. So in this miracle, Jesus reveals another sign of new life. Sight. Now, sight is the ability to perceive light. When Jesus gave this man sight, he not only gave new life, but he did it in a way that revealed his identity, which he said in verse 5, While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So here Jesus revealed what we've seen throughout John's account of Jesus' life and ministry, that life and light come together in Jesus. John tells us, John 1, verse 4, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. As Jesus re revealed himself as the light of God, he revealed new life from God. In this sign, and, and throughout the rest of the chapter, Jesus shows how this new life from God gives us a new way of looking at things. Basically, Jesus shows us how to look beyond sin to see new life. When the disciples saw the man born blind, they asked Jesus in verse 2, Who sin caused this man to be born blind? The disciples were asking this question about the man's suffering because they had some bad theology believing that bad things happen to people because they've done bad things. They thought this man was blind because he was being punished for somebody's sin, either his parents or even his own. Now, while this might have been an interesting theological question while they were walking away from the temple, Jesus shows them that they were just missing the point. Where they were looking for sin, Jesus showed them to look for new life. Jesus said in verse 3, Neither this man nor his parents sin, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Now let's be clear. Jesus wasn't saying that this man and his parents are sinless. He's just saying that this man's blindness was not a punishment for their sins. We need to understand that specific suffering in this life is not necessarily caused by our specific sins. Now sure, some people suffer consequences that come as a result of their own sins, but ultimately we find suffering in the world simply because we're descendants of Adam, the first sinner. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 5 verses 12 and 13, that just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. For the law, or before the law was given, sin was in the world. Now Paul tells us this to help us to look beyond the sin, the suffering, the death of this life to see how we can find new life in Jesus. He goes on in Romans 5 verse 15. The gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? The gift of new life that Jesus came to bring was meant to replace or restore what the old life of Adam's sin had taken from us all. This is what Jesus' sign of sight revealed to his disciples. As they witnessed the miraculous healing, Jesus showed them to look not for sin, but to see God's purposes, God's work, God's glory. So as we look beyond sin to see new life, we begin to see God's purposes. The disciples were focused on, on the sin, but Jesus wanted them to see something new. 
they saw suffering and they believed that God caused the suffering to punish for sin. But Jesus wanted them to know that God's purpose was to remove our sin so that we might live with him forever. And to accomplish this, he sent Jesus, which Jesus said in John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, through these miraculous signs that John wrote down, Jesus demonstrated God's purpose to give new life. When he showed mercy to the woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, Jesus said in John 8 verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus came as the light of the world, the light of God to give us sight so that we won't walk in sinful darkness, but live with God. John tells the early church this in his letter, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. As Jesus gives this sign of sight, we can see God's purpose to give new life through Jesus. And we see God's purpose fulfilled as we see God's work through Jesus. Jesus said, John chapter 9 verses 3 and 4 that this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day we must do the work of him who sent me. And so then Jesus went to work. It says in verses 6 and 7, having said this he spit on the ground, made some mud with a saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. And so the man went and washed and came home seeing. God's purpose was to give new life, and he fulfilled that purpose by working through Jesus. How do we know for sure? Well, the man went home seeing. The man's sight is a sign of God's work, and again, Jesus finds trouble doing God's work, because later on in the chapter, there's an investigation. John chapter 9 verses 13 through 16, John tells us that they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been born blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? And so they were divided. Just as when Jesus healed the lame man in John chapter 5, some of the religious leaders focused on what they thought was a sin, that Jesus healed on the Sabbath, the day of rest. But some saw this sign for what it was, God's work. And they said in verse 16, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? The simple answer is they can't. God works to accomplish God's purposes. So he sent Jesus to do his work to save his people, which is what Jesus announced when he began his ministry, reading from Isaiah in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. God's purpose was Jesus' purpose, and so God's work was Jesus' work. When Jesus healed the man who was born blind, he gave the sign of sight to demonstrate his power, authority, and purpose to give new life, fulfilling God's purpose by doing God's work. And in this, we can see God's glory.
because they couldn't deny that this man could now see, and because they were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus again. The religious leaders were careful about giving God credit for the healing. The, the story goes on in John chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Because of the man's testimony, the religious leaders couldn't deny that he had been healed. But even though this healing compelled giving glory to God, they refused to admit that Jesus came from God. So the man confirmed it again, saying in John 9, verses 30 through 33, now that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The simple, undeniable fact was that only God could make something like this happen. And since it did actually happen, they had witnessed God's glory through Jesus. In giving this sign of sight, Jesus revealed God himself. As John tells us, John chapter 1, verse 18, that no one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Jesus made God known revealing God's glory by doing God's work. Now here, giving sight as a sign of the new life that was soon to be made possible through Jesus' coming death and resurrection. But because they weren't willing to recognize God's purpose or God's work in this sign, the religious leaders were blinded to God's glory that Jesus revealed. Just as Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, that the gods of this age or the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Because they witnessed God's purpose and work through Jesus and yet refused to see God's glory in him, the religious leaders who thought they could see clearly were shown to be blind. Jesus told these religious leaders, saying in John 9, verses 39 through 41, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. And some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this, and asked, What, are we blind too? And Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Now, even though Jesus didn't come to bring final judgment by revealing their blindness and refusal to see God's purpose, God's work, and God's glory, Jesus showed that they were already judged by their unbelief. As he had said in John 3 verses 18 and 19, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Obviously, appearances were deceiving. The people who knew God's law best knew God least. The ones who claimed to love God most loved their own selves even more. But the one who was physically blind was able to see God clearly, while the ones who claimed to see God clearly were spiritually blind. Now the problem for both was sin, and the solution for both was to look beyond sin to Jesus who gives new life. Are you able to look beyond your sin to see the new life that Jesus offers? Some people are so conscious of their sin and sinfulness that they can't see any way possible for God to forgive them. And on the other side, we find people who are so blinded by sin that they can't see their own need for God to forgive them. 
the good news is that God wants to give us new life through faith in Jesus. And as we receive that new life, we receive new sight so that we can see God clearly and follow him as we live this new life that we found in Jesus. If you want new sight, new life in Jesus, you can receive it by putting your faith in Jesus. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross to forgive our sins and who rose again to give us new life, if you'll repent, turning away from your old life of blind sinfulness and turning back to God, if you'll confess that Jesus is the Lord of your life, and if you'll join with Jesus by dying with him, being buried with him, being raised with him in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, God will forgive you. God will give you new sight, new life, and he'll come to live within you by his Holy Spirit. Now, if you're ready to receive that new life, or if you've got any questions about anything that I've said, I invite you to contact me at Athens Church of Christ so that we can meet and work through all of that together as soon as possible. But until then, would you please let me pray for you? Father God, you know that I'm not nearly as good as I might want people to think I am. But God, I also praise you that you have given me a new life in which I can see you clearly so that I can follow you more closely, letting you change me every day. So right now I pray for those who, who are still blinded by their own sin, that you would show them yourself through your Holy Spirit, through your word, and through your people, the church, so that they might put their faith in Jesus and receive this new life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.